So the year of return keeps giving, and this time one of its products is back home. British-born Ghanaian pop Smen Sabunsu is back home in Ghana to organize his first ever basketball camp. Pops, it's good to have you on the tracker. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How's the year of return treating you so far, and uh, what have your few days in Ghana been like? Uh, it's been great, you know, the, um, it's always exciting to come back home yeah. and give back to, to my people and, and my community. And with it being the year of return and having my first camp, yeah. it's only fitting that it's, it's all happening together. So I'm excited about the amount of kids that showed up. I'm excited about the interest in the game. And it just it leaves a positive um, outlook for me, knowing yeah. moving forward that these many kids are interested and like the game. The last time I met you, um, you were alongside David West at his camp, assisting him to do some drills, fundamentals, and leadership. Um, what prompted you personally to want to come back and do a clinic of some sort on your own? These are my people. I'm one of two or three uh, Ghanaian players to play in the NBA. Yeah. And I don't like that every time we talk about Ghana, I'm the last person to play in the NBA. All the other African countries have many players who have played in the NBA. So I know moving forward, I want the narrative to be different. I want somebody to say in 2025 that this kid from Ghana is in the NBA, or in 2030 another kid from Ghana. So I don't want the same story to be that Pops Mensa Bonsu was the last Ghanaian in the NBA. So that's why I had to come back because it's my responsibility yeah. to, to help inspire these players to play the game and to use the game to better their lives. I mean, I don't know how many times you've been to Ghana plus this one, but um, there's, an, there's an Africa league of some sort beginning to spring up. Um, how do you see yourself contributing to that African league and what does that African league mean for basketball potential on the continent? Me personally, as soon as they announced the, the Africa league, I yeah. told my colleagues at NBA Africa that I'm going to own the team in Ghana. First thing I said to them, before I said anything else, I will own a team in Ghana. Mm. And he said, you know, wait, we have to put some systems yeah. in place. And part of the reason why I'm here is to implement a system yeah. so that we can have a team, so that we can have an academy for the elite players here and give them an opportunity to yeah. go and play or even give them an opportunity to play in the league here. So for me, the, what the league means, I don't think the league means anything to Africa. Africa means something to basketball. Mm. When, people, when this league came, was chosen and yeah. came, to the continent, all it's going to do is show the world what Africa has to offer. Hmm. That's interesting, but for those who don't know you, um, give us a little bit about your upbringing, where you grew up, where you were born. What, what was it like for you as a youngster coming up, growing into basketball? Oh man, it was, it was tough, you know, it's, it was similar to being in Ghana. I was born and raised in London, playing soccer, um, I was running track too. Didn't really take a, a large interest yeah. into, into basketball. I played it, but I didn't. I only played for fun. Uh, not until I moved to the U.S. and I was about 16 that I started taking it seriously. And wow. I was blessed enough to get a, a scholarship to go play at George Washington University. Wasn't that a little late? I mean, Very late. getting introduced to the game at 16 years. What sort of challenges did that present for you, especially coming up against United States kids who are probably been introduced a little earlier in their in their years yeah so as I was telling the kids I ran into a situation where these players were playing 10 years before me maybe even 12 yeah and I knew to play catch-up I had to work twice as hard and you know I was athletic I was tall I was you know I could run and I was yeah. fast but I knew my skills needed time to catch up so I told myself if I'm able to work twice as hard yeah. my um, my tr my progression would be twice as fast so that was just my mindset and my thinking. And so I just worked, I just kept working and working yeah. and working. And before I knew it, I was able to keep up with the, with the, with the, with the US players. I'll ask you a question. Going through your background, I realized that you actually went through all your four years in college. Now, you know the one and done rule and the debate around it. You can tell me from an informed point, tell me how beneficial it's been for you to have attended college for four years as compared to if you hadn't attended college for four years. Uh, I think for me, I had no choice. I needed to develop in the game. I needed to play the game so that my skills can catch up with my body. Mm. Uh, I played, like I said, I, I kept working, working, working yeah. so that I knew one day I would have an opportunity to play in the NBA. Uh, I didn't know that was possible until yeah. I started working. Mm. Um, 
you know, for me, with the one and done rule, it, it benefits a lot of guys who have reached their peak maybe early or you can see the potential. For me, I needed to develop and the only way I was going to play in the NBA was if I had reached a certain level of play. You weren't scared that you were going to be too old for NBA teams? No. I knew, uh, I knew that I could use my, my talent as a skill. Some people can shoot, some people can pass, some people can dribble. For me, my talent and my skill was working hard. I knew if you were bigger, stronger, faster, yeah. could shoot better than me, there's one thing you wasn't going to do is, is outwork me. Tell me about the feeling when you were first drafted by an NBA team. Or you went undrafted, but when you were first signed to an NBA team, what was that like for you as an individual? Well, I would go one step before that. I felt like I let down my whole country. Wow. Because I knew if a Ghanaian player was able, was able to get drafted in the NBA, these kids would be like, hey, it's, that's a Mensa Bonsu. He is not somebody... So he, that was he, a disappointment for you? For me, yeah. I, I felt like I, 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 I let down my, my, my country, my community, my family, yeah. my people, and that's another motivating factor for me to keep working so that just to get in the NBA. Hmm. Now, I, I noticed that you bounced around a lot. Can you, can you give me an idea why? Because like, you never seem to play more than two years with one NBA franchise and then you'd be off to another team. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes maybe it's God's plan. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't really tell you why that happened or what yeah. happened. It's just the way my career went. But I will tell you this, it made me the man I am today. All the different teammates, all the different teams and countries that I played in, all the different coaches that I got to experience allowed me to be seasoned in my mind mentally, in my game. And I was just able to adjust and be, um, and, uh, and, it, and it benefited me on and off the court. I mean, what's, your, what's the best team you've played for? Because I saw so many of them, I couldn't really keep a roster. It depends, was in it Spain, NBA or was in, it? In, in your, the NBA. I mean, the best NBA team you played for and why? Well, the best team I played for was the Toronto, I mean, the Dallas Mavericks. Because mm. that year we won 67 games. Yeah. We were largely considered the best team in the NBA. Um, but the best, the team that I had the best impact on was the Toronto Raptors. But why would you say that was possible? Because by that time, I felt like my game, uh, my game was be, was able to become seasoned. I, I developed a little bit yeah. more. I was a little bit more confident yeah. in my game, and I, um, you know, I was able to to impact and have a um, play on that team and yeah. be a, a featured player. So I think that's why that was probably my best experience playing. Now, right through your playing career, did you ever think that you'd come to the point where you'd actually venture into management after playing? I knew I was going to do something. I didn't know it was going to be uh, management. I didn't know it was going to be an executive in the NBA, but I always knew that some of the experiences that I had uh, were going to allow me to have an impact on the game uh, after I was done playing. What's that been like? What's management been like? How different is it? What lessons has it taught you? It's a different challenge. For me, whenever I couldn't do something when I was a player, I would um, just go to the gym and work harder, or I would go to the gym and lift weights, or just, just go twice as hard. Now, it's a different challenge. It challenges your mind mentally and emotionally, so uh, it's a challenge that I embrace and a challenge that I'm excited about, but it's not easy. I mean, I, I think that you're the perfect person to answer this question for me. Um, I personally think that a lot of G League coaches have been in a position to take over NBA franchises. A guy like Jerry Stackhouse, I thought, was in a good position to take over a team. What do they have to do to make the jump? Or what is it about the G League that makes it so hard sometimes for individuals who have a, a good background to still make the jump to the next level? Uh, I don't say, I don't think it should make it difficult. I personally think it's the best way to go. Uh, I always say if you want to experience in something, you have to do it. Yeah. So if you want to be a head coach in the NBA, you should be a head coach in the G League. If you want to be a general manager in the yeah. NBA, you should do it in the G League. It's just the lowest level and the lowest yeah. scale. And for me, I felt like that was the best way I was going to get some executive and front office experience yeah. is if I actually did it on, on the lower level. Yeah. So I know when I have my opportunity to be a general manager in, um, in the NBA, I would have already been seasoned because I did it at the G League level. Now that just leads me to um, a Ghanaian who's been working in the G League in Amida Brahma. He's been in the G League for close to two and a half years. And whenever I speak to him, he seems to think that 
his opportunity will come. Yeah. He, he's not getting any younger, but how difficult is it, I mean, really, to, to make the jump out of the G League for somebody like him who also started playing the game at a really late stage in his career? I think for, for him, he has an NBA skill. You know, he's a shot blocker, he's a rebounder, and if you perfect that and continue to perfect that, I'm, I'm sure his time will come because he does, he blocks shot at an NBA level. Yeah. So I know eventually he's going to get to the point where he's going to be on an NBA team. I, I firmly believe that because I scouted him for a couple years and I personally think he's an NBA player. So his time will come, God willing. Let's talk about your clinic now, um, the specifics of this particular clinic. Now for, for you, what was the entire train of thought to come out here and give these kids an introduction to the game or do you have a more structured, laid out plan for perhaps nurturing them after the clinics and maybe giving them like a real opportunity to shine on the next level? I'm not sure if it's the NBA, but whatever level it might be. Yeah, it's, there's a broader landscape and a broader plan in, in, in place. We want to at least have, normally when people do camps and come and build courts, they do it and then they leave and two weeks later, nothing. Yeah. For me, I wanted to have something that was consistent and something that had sustainability and had longevity. So for now, we have this camp. Every year we're gonna be doing it, hopefully maybe even twice a year. Wow. Um, but well, um, I'm gonna um, commit to starting my own academy here so that the elite players get an opportunity to showcase their elite talent. And um, uh, even the guys who are still trying to develop, we're gonna put things in place so that they're consistently cultivating that talent. Is it as if you've seen enough talent here to believe that an academy will be viable here? Um, I just say look, mm -hmm. look at the size, look at the, yeah. the talent level of these players. If they had some, some consistent coaching, some consistent infrastructure and yeah. resources, yeah. I know that in my mind these players could be the future of African basketball. There's something that I say to myself having watched the game over a while, that Sometimes it might not be the most talented players making it to the professional levels. Is that something that you believe in as well? Yeah, I'm living proof. I, was, I, was, I wasn't the most talented player, but I was, I was definitely the hardest worker. I always knew that I could use my work ethic to get me by. Yeah. And once my skills caught up with my, my work ethic, yeah. that's when everything started to come together. I don't know if you know any friends or people who looked like they were going to go professional, but just couldn't make the cut. For, for, those, for those who seem to have the talent, but just can't seem to make it to that next level, I mean, what world exists for them? Not making it to the NBA doesn't make you less of a player. There's only 450 spots in the NBA. There's probably tens of thousands of players who, who play professional basketball, yeah. and the numbers just don't add up. So I always tell guys, you're not less of a player if you don't play in the NBA. It's just your timing didn't come or the opportunity wasn't there. Hmm. And, and I asked this at your press conference that most often than not, other aspects of the game get ignored. For instance, you're only able to sit here with me to do this interview because you have coaches who are taking over your clinic. But those are not in abundant supply. And officials, I, I, I know that in the last 10 years, we've had about five referees recycled over every competition that we've had in Ghana. And that's problematic for me as a journalist. What are perhaps some efforts or what's your insight on that particular aspect of the game? Well, that's a great question. I already have something in place where I'm going to come to uh, get an NBA referee to hope to come over here and teach, the, teach more and more um, officials about the game. Teach them about um, you know, how to officiate the game the right way yeah. so that they're able to teach the other guys here while we're not, um, while, while we're not here. Okay. So these tournaments, you're not seeing the same five referees that we're also developing the coaches, the players, the officials, and then basketball in general from the top to the bottom across Ghana. So in, in, a, in a few years, I, you won't be able to say, ask me the same question because we would have hopefully changed the narrative and how everything is. Let's do a couple of bucket list questions to close out the interview. Now, a little bit away from the game, but still involved in the game. If you'd name a starting five, an NBA starting five, all-time starting five, your all-time starting five, who would be in it? Hakeem, Kevin Garnett, LeBron James, Michael Jordan, yep. Gary Payton. Hmm, that's an interesting list. Um, 
top five movies if you would recommend any to anybody? Any five movies. Any five movies. Your five movies to recommend to anybody. Usual Suspects, He Got Game, Coming to America, yeah. Shawshank Redemption, Hoop Dreams. Hoop Dreams. Interesting. Top five memories of Ghana. Wow, great question. The first time I ever stepped foot in Ghana. When was this? Five years ago. Okay. First time I ever stepped foot in Ghana, I immediately felt like I was home. Wow. Um, I met, uh, I finally got a chance to see my uncle who uh, is the Ashanti King in God knows how many years. And to see him in that position, you know, it warmed my heart. This is probably the highlight of my... Uh, Are you talking about two, four, set to two? Wow. Yeah. This is probably the highlight of my, um, of my trips to Ghana. Being able right. to put together your own clinic. Like, to see this, it makes me emotional to yeah. see 100 plus kids at this camp with yeah. my name on their jersey. And it's not about my name, but it's about something that myself and my team were able to put in place for these kids. And moving forward, it's, it's, not, it's not the only time you see this t-shirt or see this emblem. If you see the, um, the logo, yep. it's the Sankofa Adinkra yep. symbol, yep. which yep. means to come and get. And it means that it's okay to come back for something that you have forgotten. Now, I, I didn't necessarily forget my people or forget this generation, yeah. but now was time of being the year of return that it was perfect for me to come back and, and do this camp to show them that, hey, we thinking about you, we, we love you, we, we, um, we, we're, we understand that the game, that you're important and that we're gonna keep pouring into you. Hmm. You gave me two moments though, unless you have only two moments. I gave you three. You gave me three moments. Uh, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it at three for you. Okay, give, okay. Me, give me five books to recommend the five books you've read. The Audacity of Hope by Barack Obama. Hmm. Uh, I'm reading a book called um, The Emotion Emotional Intelligence from Harvard Business Review. Okay. I read uh, For the Love of the Game. Okay. It's a book all about basketball. I think it's one of the first basketball books I ever read, which, uh, which uh, allowed me to love the game. The Energy Bus. Yeah. Energy Bus, I, I've been watching. That's a, another great one. And The Four Agreements. The Four Agreements. Interesting. Yeah. What are we likely to find you doing outside basketball? If you're not playing GM for GoGo, uh, -Go, you know, teaching kids how to play basketball. What are we likely to ever find you doing? Jaku, Jaku. I'm dancing. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> no, I saw your steps from <laughs> the yeah, arrival yeah, hall. Yeah, yeah. They weren't that bad. Uh, yeah, they for, that for bad. somebody with six knee surgeries, they were okay. Um, <laughs> wow. That's a good question. I, with my life being so busy now, yeah. whenever I get a chance, I'll spend my time with the kids and, um, you know, rest rest up a little bit, but I like to laugh. I like to have good energy around me. So if I can, I like to go to comedy clubs. I like to go to movies. I like to go bowling. And I just, I love the game. So I still, I'm around the game, even when I'm not supposed to be, you know? I don't know how much of a sneaker head you are, but if you had to recommend five sneakers for me as a person or anybody. Basketball well, sneakers. No, five sneakers for my closet. Five sneakers uh -huh, for my okay, closet. Coach Mesa Bosus five sneaker recommendations. It's good because one of the kids is wearing the ones I'm talking about right now. Mm. So I would I would pick a basketball sneaker which would probably be for streetwear, the Jordan 4 or the 11. Yeah. So I, that's two, the Jordan 4 or the 11. So walk around in, I would say Adidas Shelto or okay. um, Stan Smith. Um, <laughs> the Jordan 1 too. See, I like a lot of Jordans here. The, the, the Jordan 1, so that's four. And then the last one would be, oh, a Hirachi, a Nike Hirachi, Nike my favorite Hirachi. sneaker. Wow. Nike Hirachi is my favorite sneaker of all, on the court and off the court. I didn't see that coming. Yeah. I didn't see that coming. Yeah. Give me your top five musicians of all time. Jay-Z, Biggie Smalls, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, and for some that Beyonce. Wow, Beyonce. Okay, I didn't see that coming as well. Um, top five places to visit? Ghana, 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 Ghana. Are you sure about that? No. <laughs> I went to, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I went to Dakar yeah. in Senegal, and it reminds me a lot of Ghana. I think the people, how positive they are, yeah. how their temperament, the food yeah. is, is great. They have good jollof rice there too. 
Um, so I would say Ghana, I would say Senegal, I would say Barcelona, mm. I would say Toronto, and Istanbul. We're smoking about your movies, we're smoking about sneakers, we're smoking about practically everything. Let me round it up with cars. I don't know how much of a car freak you are, but five cars for your garage, and then we close this out. Well, my favorite car that I, I don't like to talk about the stuff that I bought, but <laughs> I got a Tesla, yeah. an electric car. Um, the Porsche Panamera, like the uh, the BMW 760, yeah. hmm. I love. The Infiniti uh, QX56 was my first car, so it's always going to have a special place in my yeah. heart. And a Range Rover. Hmm. Finally, the year of return is, I mean, it's really been great. Guys like you have come through. Are you possibly going to come down in December to climax the year or this is it for you no I, I, see i would wish i could the reason why yeah. doing it now was best for me because it's the middle of the season if i could get away for a week or two i would yeah. i would for sure come back here yeah. and it hurts me that i'm never able to come at christmas because of my job but i think i always look at it as a sacrifice i have to make to continue to put um, in place some opportunities for these kids who wins the nba title upcoming 20 2019 2020 season the Washington Wizards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, mm. having us on the tracker. Welcome back to the tracker here on City TV. From dissecting the life of a player, we now turn our attention to the life of an executive. John Manuel Plant has just been freshly elected vice president and also head of strategy and development for the Basketball Africa League. John, it's great to have you on the tracker. Great to see you. I mean, for, for those who don't know who you are and are seeing you for the first time, sure. who's John Manuel Plant? And how do you come across such a sophisticated title like the vice president and the head of strategy and development of a BAL. Sure, well, the good thing is it all started here. Um, I was born and raised in Ghana. Um, lived here till I was about 13 years old. Okay. Um, and then moved born to in the, Accra? Born in Accra. In okay. fact, my family house is right down the street in Kamasokai. Wow. Um, so, um, lived here and then moved to the U.S. for my education. So went to university there, and then from there went to work in the NBA, and I've been at the NBA now for 22 years, the last 10 of which um, in Johannesburg, launching yeah. NBA Africa. Talk to me about leaving college and getting a job in the NBA. One, how connected do you have to be? How smart do you have to be? What does it take to land such a job? Yeah, I think the, the, the story that I like to, you know, or, or, or the, um, the, the snippet that I like to say is, you know, when people say, oh, you know, I love the sport of basketball, yeah. I want to work for the NBA, what do I have to do? And I say, well, at the end of the day, you should be the best at whatever it is that you do. Mm. Whether it's in marketing, it's in business development, yeah. it's in computer science, it's in legal, finance, on, on, on. Because at the end of the day, basketball is the core of what we do. Yeah. Right? 
we cherish it, it's you know special to us, we take care of it, but there's a business around it. And that business requires the best and the brightest from every industry that you can think of. Hmm. Now talking about the best in everything, what did you think your elite skill was that appealed to the MBA and how has that evolved into making you the man you are now? So my unique skill, I think, is that I'm a generalist by nature. Um, and what I mean by that is I don't necessarily like to focus and specialize on one thing. I, I, I'm, I'm a very challenge-oriented person and I love yeah. to learn. So for me, being able to be involved in lots of different aspects of the business yeah. has been my career there. So I've worked in probably about 10 different departments wow. in my 22 years. So that's pretty much on average moving around every two, two to three years into doing something different. And so that is actually reflected in, in my title, Head of Strategy and Operations. It's not a very specific yep. job of operations such, obviously but I span pull over large. everything together. Yeah. So I, I, I know enough to be dangerous in Just marketing about, and this and that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Talk to me a, a little bit about the Basketball Africa League and when was this idea birthed and what's the end game to this entire uh, phenomenon that we are calling the basketball league? Sure. When we first um, moved um, and launched NBA Africa, we um, decided that the best thing to do was to start um, in the development of the sport. You know, so we focused on uh, launching our junior NBA programs. Yeah. And now we have that running in 14 countries um, around the continent and are expanding that to 20 very soon. And then we, you know, obviously have had our basketball without borders program running for many years now. And then we we launched a few years ago our NBA Academy. And so, as you start to, you know, look at that development pyramid, right, yeah. where you have junior NBA at the bottom, mm -hmm. there still ne needed to be something at the top. Um, and so the Basketball Africa League for us is a critical thing for us to provide opportunities for kids to be able to play at the highest level while staying on the continent. And one story I like to tell, um, one year in our Basketball Without Borders program, a young kid stood up and asked us the question, what happens to those of us that don't make it? And when we asked him, what does don't make it mean? In his mind, making it meant leaving the African continent. In his mind, success meant leaving Africa. And right then and there, we said to ourselves, our job is to build an infrastructure and an ecosystem here where an African kid can dream to be a high level basketball player and stay on the continent and develop. Now to talk about the, the league itself, what informed your decision to pick what specific cities to play in, which specific teams to make up the core of the league and how do the other teams also get involved? Because sure. we know that it's definitely not going to be restricted to certain countries alone. Yes, yes. So, I mean, we, we, we truly wanted to be a Pan-African league. Yeah. Um, and so, but at the same time, we have to make sure that there is representation from the strongest basketball yeah. countries and the most populous basketball countries. Yeah. Um, so we, we chose to play the games in Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Senegal, Angola, and Nigeria. Those are, those are the six countries that yeah. the regular season will be played in. Now, it's a Champions League, so in those countries, their domestic club champion yeah. would then be eligible to play in our Champions League. There are 12 teams overall. Mm -hmm. Six of the teams will come from those six countries. Yeah. The other six will then be chosen through a series of qualifying tournaments that FIBA will run. Yeah. And those qualifying tournaments, um, right now we've got 40 countries that plan to compete for six slots. Hmm. Interesting. Now, you didn't mention where the grand finale would take place, but you said that this was a Champions League Correct. system, sort of. Um, where, where, where would the final be staged? Yeah. And why did you pick that particular venue for a final? Sure. So we decided to um, play the finals in Kigali in Rwanda. Um, and I think for some people, they would say, you know, why Rwanda? It's yeah. not traditionally known to be a very strong basketball country. The thing is, we also want to use this league to develop the 
infrastructure and the ecosystem across the continent. And we had a conversation with the government of Rwanda, specifically President Kagame. Um, there was a delegation made up of um, C Commissioner Silver, um, Deputy Commissioner Tatum, um, Amadou Galofal, who's our, you know, um, um, the president of uh, right, Mascabola. Yes. And so they, they, they went to Rwanda and had the conversation to say, we need to develop infrastructure on the continent. And President Kagame pledged to build an indoor facility. And in 11 months, they built a 10,000 seat indoor venue. Um, so we like to say, if you build it, we will come, you know, and not just basketball, but this venue can be the ec economic driver for True. an entire area. Yeah. And we can have a lot of this happening across the continent. Currently, when concerts and comedy shows and international yeah. events yeah. come through the continent, yeah. they all go to yeah. South Africa because so that's where the, that's where the, infrastructure, that's where the inf is. infrastructure is. Now, if we had infrastructure in Ghana, they would yeah. come here. If we had it in Nigeria, they would go there. So it makes a lot of sense for us to really focus on this area of things. Is there a process to starting the conversation here in Ghana with the president and saying that we have so much potential here, if you begin something, we will come here and we will give you the support to make it happen? Yeah, so I mean, you know, that's why we, we chose this time to come. You know, um, we feel like the government here, you know, with the, um, the um, return program has been really welcoming for the diaspora to come back and, you know, help contribute and invest back, you know, into Ghana and so we feel this is the right time to start that conversation and you are positive that from just about what you've seen this is going to be a progressive conversation we think so we think so I mean we are very very hopeful um, we're having meetings um, next week um, you know that will hopefully yield that commitment and that support I mean for for you as a basketball executive 
Um, how challenging is that particular life? How busy is that type of life? And do you get any time to actually do anything else? Um, it is, it is, it is extremely challenging, extremely busy, but extremely rewarding. Um, I travel about 200 days a year. So if you think about that, that's more than half of the calendar year I'm on the road because our continent is so big, you know, um, and you know, if you really want to make an impact, you actually have to physically go to places and engage with people. Um, and so that's what we um, do. So it's very challenging, but as I said, rewarding too. Hmm. Now for, for Ghana as a basketball hub, I mean, do you ever see a point where we can have a domestic league in Ghana that can blossom into something that will feed into the bigger basketball Africa league? Or do you think that we are quite a distance from making something like that happen? No, I mean, these things can happen very, very quickly. All it takes is energy and focus and the will, you know. So, you know, an example now is Pops has retired from his playing days yeah. and he's committed to coming back here and making sure that He's not the last Ghanaian to play in the, in the National Basketball Association. So, you know, it's, 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 it's really the time to start looking at it and focusing, you know, on, you know, on it now. So it can happen very, very quickly. If, if a 10,000 seat indoor stadium can go up in 11 months, imagine what can happen here. Hmm. Talk to me a little bit about the difficulty into, in making it into an elite league. Even not just the NBA, but even Basketball League Africa. Because I know that before you can even emerge as an academy product from, say, basketball without borders and be furthered onto the next level, yep. they need to see, or the scouts and executives need to see something special in you. Yep. What do you usually look out for in potential talent that you take up to the next level? Yeah, I mean, you know, clearly we, um, we, are, we are into sports. So there's a physical aspect to it. But more importantly, there's a mental aspect to it. There's an intelligence to it. There's a dedication, commitment, yeah. you know, discipline. You know, so those are the, the, the tangibles and intangibles that we look for. Yeah. The other piece of it is that hunger and that drive to be the best. Competition. Hmm. Competition sharpens every edge, right? So what, what, what we have to focus on is giving our kids the the best chance for as much competition as possible and when they start to compete against kids who are at an elite level they start to understand that they too can do it as well i mean you talk about competition um talk about having a good mental edge to be able to do this i still i still also say that perhaps um there isn't enough touch point opportunities for children to relate to Sure. Pops comes happen, let's say, once every six months. Yep. Um, on, on the local scene, what do you think a body like, say, the Federation should be doing to further the course of basketball just so it can have something sustainable before these other camps come around? Yeah. So I like to start by focusing and celebrating what is happening. You know, so if you look at the Sprite Ball program, yeah. that's been going on for quite a few years yeah. now. Um, you know, and Yao has put everything that he, you know, has into that program. And the mass of, of, you know, kids that participate in that program. Plus, when you look at the school rivalries and the dancing and the singing and yeah. the energy and the, and the, you know, culture around it. For me, that's what we need to celebrate and we need to build around that, right? But it's also not just about, you know, um, looking at what we have, but also what we can be. And I think that's where we need to make sure that there's government support for, yeah. for the Federation and you know, all the things that they want to do. Um, you know, and it's also about organization and unity. What I find is there are a lot of fragmented parties that are trying to do different pieces of basketball. And we all have to come together and figure out how to work together to be unified. If you had to give a message to young people out there watching us right now about a myth concerning why they cannot make it in the world of basketball, what would it be? So one thing that we keep hearing over and over and the question that we get is, well, Ghanaians aren't tall, you know, so why should we focus on basketball, you know, um, as a sport? And I say, well, two things. One, it's a misnomer that we're, we're, we're not 
tall. In every population, you have short people and you, and you have taller people, right? Definitely. Pops is six foot nine. His whole family is, you know, um, tall. And you have to look at our region as well. When you go up north, you have a lot of tall people. So the fact that the population is, is, is not tall is, first of all, not true. Secondly, you don't have to be tall to play the sport of basketball, right? There have been some very short people that have played. And you look at some of the best players, you know, Steph Curry is not that tall. Tony Parker, I Tony Parker is not Tony that tall. Parker. You know, Spud Webb, Earl Boinkins. Maxi Bogues. On, like, yeah, on and, on and on and on and on. So we, you know, have to embrace the fact that this is about exploiting and maximizing yeah. what, what your strengths are. It can be that you're fast, it, it, it can be that you're strong, it can be that you are you know, can shoot well. Yeah. So whatever those things are, you as a person, your job is to maximize that. Finally, before you go, what does a year of return mean to you as a Ghanaian who's lived a greater part of your life outside the motherland but still makes a lot of trips back in here? What does yeah. it mean for you? You know, it, it's, it's, it's very special for me because I feel like it's, it's the first time that there is a formal embrace of the diaspora. Um, you know, I left when I was 13 years old. Um, I still speak Ga a little bit, but whenever you come back, you never feel fully Ghanaian, right? Yeah. Um, and I feel like, you know, this platform gives it, you know, that legitimacy to be able to say, you know, Yes, you left, but you're welcome back. Um, and I think that's an important thing for the entire country to embrace. And not to say that anybody who's lived overseas is better or worse than anyone else, but they've had different experiences. And it's useful for us to bring that experience back here mm -hmm. and then for us to then learn from the people who have stayed here as well. So, John, it's been amazing hanging Pleasure. out with you on the track. Hopefully we can catch up next time you're in town. Absolutely. All right, cool. So you've heard it all from the men who are involved in the game, from the players, from the executive, and also hopefully the kids out here who have been introduced to some basketball education who will take it up to the next level. Until then, we'll see you on the next episode of The Tracker.